Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I am delighted to be joined today by three executives from three different parts of the ecosystem. Uh, to my left, we have Asif. Asif is the Chief Product Officer uh, at WorldPay, and uh, he is uh, responsible for a broad remit uh, spanning from new product development all the way over to marketing. So um, the, one of the largest payment companies in the world um, and really uh, has a lot to talk about with respect to security, safety, uh, and new product development related to added va adding value to his merchant customers. Uh, to his left, we have Lynn. Lynn is uh, from Allstate. She manages the treasury and cash business at Allstate, one of the uh, largest insurers in the US, um, the largest public company insurer in the US, insuring 16 million people, and has a lot to bring to the table around disbursements uh, and leveraging technology to provide instant disbursement to uh, her insurees. And then to her left, we have Matt Cole, who's the president of uh, Cubic, which is one of the largest transit operators in the globe. Uh, and Matt's been focused on enabling transit uh, authorities across the globe to accept contactless payments. And so while each of them come from different walks of life, they actually all share common goals. Um, three, to be exact. One is they're awesome partners with MasterCard. Uh, the second is as the world is migrating from uh, physical to digital, they have an absolute laser focus on ensuring a terrific consumer experience. Uh, and they also have a uh, keen interest and are making great investment in making sure those transactions are seamless, frictionless, and have the best security surrounding them. Uh, so we're just gonna talk a little bit about each of their businesses and ask them a few questions. So I'll start with a question for the team, which is really around this transition from, from physical to digital and how each of your organizations are preparing yourselves for a fully digitally engaged consumer. Um, so Asifa's chief product officer, you're, uh, you know, this is squarely within uh, your scope of responsibilities to think about this. How is WorldPay thinking about the transition from physical to digital? Great. For, uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Linda and ETA for hosting this great event. I want to also thank ETA for recognizing WorldPay as Partner of the Year. We're yes, very, congratulations. Very thrilled to have that, uh, that honor and also recognize ETA for, you know, pulling this group together to talk about really important industry changes that are happening around you know, rapid technology changes as well. Um, so as Chief Product Officer at WorldPay, one of the things that, that we did early on was take inventory of all of our products and, and all the capabilities that we had, and we put a new framework around it, and this really specifically to address your question. Uh, we took a merchant-centric view to start to think about how uh, merchants interact and connect with us. So uh, we created uh, Access WorldPay, which is a frictionless API for merchants to interact with us virtually through any type of channel. Uh, and the second one is, is protect, uh, it's a protect value stream. And this is where we work very closely with our partners like MasterCard and enable the MasterCard digital enablement services, uh, MasterCard uh, network tokens, and also SRC to think about creating a frictionless experience as uh, consumers interact uh, with, our, with our merchants. The third bucket and area that we have is pay, which is what we're known for around transaction processing, settlement, authorization. We do that obviously globally and we do it at scale. And the fourth bucket is grow. Those are the capabilities and products that we, we work with to help effectively grow our merchants' businesses. And then the last one is really around experience and it ties to that overall partner experience and customer experience. Fantastic. Lynn. And we took a similar view. We looked at it from our customers' perspective, so our insureds, and what do they need and what can we help them with? Oftentimes when they're looking for a payment from us, it's because something terrible happened. Something, there's a catastrophe with their home, they've, they've had a car accident. We don't want to add any other burden to them. So our goal is to give them a product that we can pay them quickly for, and they don't have to do anything. It just is very seamless to them. And without them having to, to spend a lot of time worrying about the safety of a transaction or how it all works, we just wanted to do it for them. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Matt, uh, uh, Cubic, thinking about that physical to digital transition. So it's only been a 50-year journey for transit. Um, 
So uh, Cubic's been in the transit payments business for nearly 50 years. We'll have our 50th anniversary in 2021. And during that time, the, the technology associated with paying for transit has gone from the token to the magnetic stripe ticket uh, to the closed loop transit smart card. Uh, more recently, as um, demonstrated by our successful system in London, contactless payments. And uh, recently, we, we did a, an announcement where we're doing virtual transit cards in, in an Apple wallet in Chicago with, with Apple. And so it, it's been a pretty long journey to get to digital payments in, in transit. And we're thinking about seeing that roll out across all of our cities around the world, but then also then leveraging that to make people's journeys better. So leveraging that digital relationship you have with the traveler um, through the payment system to generate predictive, personalized information that helps their journey go better. But then in the aggregate as well, provide cities with the, the tools and the applications they need to optimize travel across the city and the region as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So as you've gone through this transition and for transit, it has been uh, 50 years. What are some of the challenges that you faced in terms of really getting to scale around a digital solution for transit? Uh, no question is the complexity of the ecosystem. Um, whilst, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of the benefits later, but um, in, the, in the closed loop smart card environment, uh, say the Clipper card in the Bay Area, for example, you have a proprietary relationship between the card reader and the card. Um, and so as the systems integrator and the systems provider, it's, it's relatively easy for us to make sure that transaction is secure um, there's very little certification we need to do outside of our own capability. Um, whereas in, in the contactless payments environment and with the mobile ecosystem, you've got all of these other partners that we need to work with and they bring value to the system, no question. But in terms of the process of delivering the system, it adds a lot, a lot of complexity, adds cost in terms of the certifications that you need to do and so on. Right. Right, yeah, more, more ecosystem players means a more complex um, infrastructure to build and, and yeah. to, to operate around. So, so the, sure. the, benefits, the benefits make it worthwhile, but in terms of delivering the programs, it adds complexity for sure. For sure. Yeah. Lynn, at Allstate, um, some of the challenges around the digital migration. Um, ours was really one of education. So we have about 20 to 25,000 claim adjusters throughout the United States. And they are employees, and then they're also uh, third-party contractors. So we had a hard time with getting out to each of them to explain why this is better to pay someone digitally. You know, they have been paying people via check for 80 years. So it works. Why do they need to change? So it was really a lot about getting out there and explaining to them the benefits and how not only does it benefit the customer, but it'll benefit them because that transaction then closes sooner. They don't have follow-up coming back through. But really, um, some of the, the pain points were really, you know, we went out first, and so it was a little bumpy at first when we went out with our first electronic payment. Um, that has since changed, and we're starting to see some momentum pick up. Uh, especially with a lot of the catastrophes that we've had with um, the recent hurricanes, with California wildfires. I think a lot of our folks have really seen the benefit to going with a digital payment and how much it really does help not only just the customer, but it helps them too because they all want to know what's in it for them. So we've been doing a lot of training and retraining and contests uh, and things like that to really get everybody on board and to really get the paper checks out of the infrastructure, except for when a customer wants it. Um, we have taken the approach that it really is up to the customer what they want. So um, we still have it available, although it's you know kind of down on the list of options when we when we approach a customer. Mm -hmm. And with your 25,000 adjusters that you have, are you finding that they've come up to speed quickly on how to articulate the value of the product? And Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think when it first went out, a lot of them didn't understand it because they weren't using it. And now as they're using it in their personal lives, I think they're able to explain it a lot better to the customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So, Asif, as you're thinking about um, the challenges that you're facing as a global organization, one of the largest focused on technology and payments, what are some of the complexities around your business that puts a damper on innovation? Yeah. So great question. If you think about today's world, right, even from a consumer perspective, things have changed, right? You think about how we're um, 
we're taking transportation with respect to Uber and how you can come in and out with completely frictionless, no, no payment interaction or virtually no payment interaction or how you know, you're shopping online for things and without having to enter everything again with digital wallets and that type of capability, we found that merchants expect the exact same thing as well, right? They don't want to have a ton of friction uh, in the process of whether it's onboarding or, or interacting with our company. 80% um, of the way that we go to market today is with a number of different channels. And so whether it's through a banking channel or whether it's through an ISV, an integrated software vendor, or it's through an ISO, um, our legacy infrastructure is coming from a bank type organization. So uh, the technology stack is kind of you know, a little bit older. So the way that people used to interact with us, whether they were sending over a lead or a form, would come in through a fax, right? <laughs> or coming even through, even today, coming through an email. It just, there's, there's just extra steps in which to onboard and creates a, a tremendous amount of friction. So what we've done is we've really focused on that user experience from both a merchant and a customer standpoint. And we've created capabilities like Launchpad, which help us uh, accelerate the automated onboarding process, right? As a matter of fact, we're actually working with MasterCard right now uh, on a, uh, a joint smart onboarding process. So we're leveraging partner capability to try to accelerate and improve that, that onboarding process uh, and underwriting, as well as you know, move towards things like deferred settlement capability and, and just really providing a seamless and smoother experience as we interact with our merchants in, in the new digital age. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so part of one of the challenges that no one uh, actually raised is uh, dealing with fraud and, and preventing fraud as much as possible. And it's obviously a multifaceted uh, complex problem uh, which has no one magic bullet. Um, but talk to us a little bit about what are the uh, mitigants that you're putting into the system particularly in the digital environment, to protect against fraudsters. You want yeah. maybe see if we could so, start with you. So WorldPay is one of the largest uh, payment processors in the world, right? We manage uh, 40 billion transactions annually. So we're in a very unique situation to be able to see unique sets of data from a merchant acquiring standpoint that give us uh, insight into, you know, basically the ability to help with authorizations, increasing authorizations, lowering fraud. So we take those unique data sets, we look you know, across all of our different businesses, across all the different verticals, and apply that data science, machine learning, AI, to really help make better decisions uh, around fraud. And like I said, ultimately our goal is to create higher authorizations and reduce fraud. That makes sense. Lynn, how much uh, of a problem is fraud within your ecosystem? And if it is, what are you doing to combat it? You know, we're in a little bit of a different situation that we're kind of lucky in that um, typically when we are making a payment to someone, um, the, the adjuster's there, they're at their house, we have all their information, um, we have, we're, we're looking at their car. So it's, it's a little bit different in that we do um, have a little bit of a personal relationship. So we're trying to pay that person out and we're in their home. They're not going to give us fraudulent banking information at that point. Uh, but that's not to say that we're we're immune from fraud. We we do have that. So we we're doing things like before we make a payment to a new customer that came to us via an online method, we are um, kind of slowing the process down a little bit so that we can do account validation and we can do authentication on that um, for those newer um, uh, the newer policies that we're getting. And we're also looking with our life insurance folks because oftentimes we don't make payments to them for years and years if they've got a, a life policy. And over those years, their payment information may have changed. So prior to us making any large payments, we're contacting that customer, we're making sure that we have the right information. If, they've, if anyone has changed any payment information in the last year on those policies, we are validating that before we send those out because those are bigger dollar payments typically. Um, and we want to make sure that it's it's getting to the right person. So we do have some, but it's a little bit different mm -hmm. in that we we have that relationship with our customer. But as more and more of our processes go electronic, so now today if you have a, um, a fender bender, you don't have to go to one of our driving claim centers. Um, you can take pictures in your driveway. So now we're we're losing some of that personal touch. So we are looking at what we need to do then to make sure that we are making appropriate payments. So we're doing more of the validation and um, we're still lucky in that, you know, we have their VIN from their cars, so we're able to, to track it back that way. Mm -hmm. um, 
we are also doing, uh, creating a payments hub within our organization. So that way we can see if you're paying us electronically and then you give us a different electronic banking information, we can match that up to say, you know, you pay us out of this account. Are you sure that you want this to go out of this other account? So we are trying to use some of the AI and the machine learning with that to be able to match up that customer information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then from a transit perspective, um, from a payment perspective, there's a lot that you're doing on the back end, I know, Matt, to ensure that we're minimizing fraud by leveraging the best technology that we have on the market. But why don't you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, conversely, I mean, in, in, in our industry, speed of the transaction is the, one of the most mm -hmm. important things. Um, and so on the, on the front end, uh, we, we put in place as much preventative technology that we can, um, which is a combination of tools that we get from partners like MasterCard, as well as some custom stuff that we build into our systems. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the good things about the transit environment is a lot of the cards you see a lot of the time, which means that you can create lists of known good cards and known bad cards and keep those lists regularly updated across the front end devices, which allows you to make very quick decisions there on the front end. And then on the, on the back end, we do a lot of detective and analytical work um, to look at you know, the success of those transactions over time um, so that we can feed back into those, those lists that we're regularly distributing across the system to make sure you know, we're making a smarter decision in that short amount of time we have as possible. And then when we get chargebacks, we, we do a lot of analysis on, on chargebacks and, and so on. So flipping the, the switch a little bit, we've talked a lot about digital, but the reality is, is whether you're uh, dealing with merchants, consumers, or transit authorities, the reality is you need to be able to service a digital environment as well as a physical environment. Many transactions are still happening in a brick and mortar capacity. Our data shows 90% um, of our volume is actually still physical. So while you're migrating fast and furiously to a digital environment, you need to maintain a really good UX in the physical space as well. And so can you talk, each of you talk a little bit about how you retain both a good UX, ensure great fraud protection, while continuing to migrate to digital in the process? It's a, it's a delicate balance. Why don't we start, Matt, with you? Yeah, okay, um, in, the, um, in the transit environment, it inevitably ends up with brick and mortar, right? Because when people, when people take their journeys, they're, they're moving across physical infrastructure. So the, the only purely digital thing we do really is when people are reloading um, their cards or you know, their purses, either through our mobile app or, th or through the website. But normally, you know, when they actually go to validate their journey, they're doing that in, in a physical environment, even if the payment technology they're using is digital and in terms of you know, retailing to transit riders it's an absolute necessity that you provide a range of options because of the social access and social equity demands of, of the transit environment so in the majority of our cities um, the need for cash acceptance um, is is there i mean in fact in all of our cities the need for cash acceptance at least at a ticket vending machine is there um, and in the, in the majority of our systems, actually being able to pay with cash on the bus mm -hmm. is still a requirement. Yeah. Um, there's very few cities that have taken that on and, and totally eliminated cash off the bus. But even those that have, have requirements where you need to be able to convert cash to some kind of transit value in some proximate location um, so that you can, you know, so that you don't have an issue with boarding the bus. Um, and so that's, that's gonna be a, a major requirement for us for, for the foreseeable future. Yeah, and from an inclusion perspective as well. It's, right, exactly. You know, from a regulatory and governmental perspective, yeah. it's, uh, it's absolutely critical that you maintain both yep. uh, channels of acceptance. Yep. Um, Lynn, how about in your world? Um, are folks, you, you mentioned the transition being a little difficult for some, small percentage, but there is still a small percentage. So what are you doing for them? Uh, so we have, uh, on, on our receipt side, we have a brick and mortar, but they're the agent offices. So we still take in a lot of cash and coin within the agent offices, along with paper checks. So we require our agents to take those to one of our banking partners, and we have a system set up for them. And they have to go every day, so it's very painful for them. 
uh, we're rolling out mobile capabilities, so at least those agents that only have paper checks for the day don't have to take the trip to the bank. They can do mobile, at least turn those into electronic checks that way, and that way they're only going to uh, the bank with cash. The problem is that it's not a large amount of cash in any one agent's offices, so there's about 10,000 agents around the con country, and they might take $25 every day. So it's, it's small dollars, so some of the items that are out there like smart safes and things of like that, it just doesn't economically work to do that. So we're still trying to work on that. We are starting to see less and less cash come through, which is nice because cash is expensive and cash is hard to deal with. Um, but we still see a lot of checks coming through um, on the receipt side. I, and, and we did do a big push to get folks to either use card or ACH or some type of electronic payment. On the um, payments that we make to customers, um, you know, we have a little bit of a, a, a drop-down menu and we've put checks at the very bottom of all the choices. So we have a suite of payments that we allow the adjusters to offer. Um, and we've kind of put them in order of what we want offered uh, and when. And that's made it a little bit better and helped that transition to, to get through that. But um, we will always have um, both, you know, manual and electronic payments. And I, I think that's one of the hard parts is that you still have to keep up those old processes that you have. So you you want to convert, but you really can't. And so um, in some cases, it's very costly to keep that up. So you're not, not eliminating anything. You just keep piling on new options. And that's where I think it gets um, a little tough to manage sometimes just from the, the cost perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think choice is absolutely paramount when you're dealing with uh, consumers directly. When you're dealing with merchants, same thing. Yeah. So how, how are you managing that? Yeah, so in our, I just go back to the consumer experience, right? You think about how we all shop today, right? We're shopping online, but then we might want to go return something in the store, right? So those lines start to get blurred where the omni-channel commerce solutions are really, really important. So we're focusing a lot on that in terms of the overall user experience and where we're investing in, right? So we also have a number of different lines of businesses where we have some businesses that are really focused around card present and, and brick and mortar, but we also have dedicated channels like our global e-commerce business, which is card not present. So we have to be thinking about really about both. So we have a multi-pronged strategy in terms of where we're investing dollars to accelerate capability. We also have a dedicated UX group that's really thinking about that, that overall user experience, right? I think historically you'd, effect, you'd just go build a product and go take it to market. And you know, if it was good, it was good. If it wasn't, it wasn't. Now we're starting to really think about you know, how, are, how are people responding to that? How can we make things better and improve that, that user experience? So. Yeah, and, and again, it's a transition that's going to take many, many years. Yep. Um, and I always say, when people ask me how long cash is going to be around or how long yep. plastic is going to be around, it'll be as, uh, uh, as, as long as one person wants to use it, we have to service them, right? So yep. it's going to take a while. And even things like, so for example, contactless, mobile, all these different ways that people are interacting, right? That's even, that still ties to point of sale and card, card present transactions, right? Absolutely. So. So Asif, as Chief Product Officer, uh, you have a myriad of opportunities that you have in front of you from a product development perspective and prioritization perspective. How do you think about um, your pipeline and you know, the, the, uh, not only the priorities that, that WorldPay may have, but now as you're thinking about a combined entity with FIS, how do you think about your roadmap and prioritization within that roadmap? Yeah, I'm sure it's going to change with the FIS uh, uh, integration, right? Uh, so first and foremost, we, we segment our business into two sectors. We have merchant solutions, which is our traditional merchant business, and then we have our technology solutions, which is our global e-commerce and integrated payments. That was the old Mercury business that integrates into ISVs. So the the technology solutions business is where we're focused a lot of our investment on. It's a business that if, if you all follow the, you know, the public markets, you'll see that those are the businesses for us that are growing by double digits. And that's where we have you know, everything that we're talking about here, which, which is the move to digital, not only just e-commerce, but new, new channels and ways that people are doing business, right? If you think about our traditional sectors of, of where we used to serve in restaurant and retail, now you see things like you know, Uber Eats and Grubhub and, and new business models that are emerging in terms of digital. So our business is continually pivoting to be able to invest 
and capabilities to serve those types of businesses, as well as marketplaces like Uber and Lyft and, and uh, you know, uh, companies like that. So uh, we're continuing to really think about where the future of uh, commerce is going and make sure that we're spending our dollars uh, in there. At the same time, we have to balance our existing business, right? So we're, we're doing you know, a tremendous amount of volume we've, we've got. Uh, we're doing business all around the world in, in literally almost every country. So we have to make sure that we're investing in things also like compliance and you know, security solutions. And you saw a release that we just did around fraud site, which is our new fraud capability. So uh, we're, we're really focusing on, on a number of different strategic priorities. Yeah, and I'm sure the prioritization is only going to get more difficult as the integration uh, with FIS uh, advances. But it is. I'll, I'll just touch on that real quick, right? So, so we're excited about this this merger coming together. FIS has 45 of the top 50 financial institutions around the world. So, if you think about the distribution capability that they have, you know, for WorldPay. Uh, in terms of offering not only the banking solutions that they offer, but now packaging that up with uh, merchant services that represents a large opportunity. And then data as well, as we've talked about, you know, as we think about fraud and trying to improve authorization rates for our merchants and create that better experience, taking data sets from, that we have, as well as maybe issuer insights, and also working very closely with MasterCard with unique sets of data there as well, we think that we can really package and create some of the market leading solutions in terms of fraud management in the future. So it represents a tremendous opportunity that will definitely reprioritize a roadmap in the, in the short term. Yeah, you'll, you're gonna continue to have a difficult job. <laughs> um, Lynn, we talked about uh, how Allstate is really transforming the way consumers receive their disbursements. You were a pioneer in the space, uh, you did it first. What's been the impact that you've heard customers actually telling you um, in terms of improving their lives or making their lives better? Um, what's been that direct feedback that you've actually heard from the customer themselves? Well, my very favorite is one of the first transactions we ever did was a woman that came in and it was uh, during one of the catastrophes and we said to her, you know, we're trying this out. Would you, would you just check your bank, online banking? Could you just log in and check to see if you've got the money? And she, uh, she jumped up and she hugged the adjuster and she said, I can't believe it, I have the money already. Do you need me to do a commercial? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we had, we videotaped it, we, it was kind of funny, but we show that because it really does make a difference. We're, when we started on our path of electronic payments, it was shortly after Hurricane Katrina. And our problem was we were mailing checks to people whose homes no longer existed, or if their home did exist, they weren't there because they've moved out either with relatives, many moved, moved to Houston, they were living in, in all different places. So we were sending these checks really to no one and people couldn't get themselves back on their feet because they needed those funds. So we really went down the path of what can we use and our, our goal was really to find something that we could pay people quickly in times of need. So we want to get them to a safe place, we want to get them some food, we want to get clothing and anything else they need. And really our main goal was we got to get them into a hotel. Hotels won't let you come in unless you have a credit or debit card that they can present that has funds on it. So that was our main goal. And we've expanded that now to be really day-to-day -day transactions that we just pay that way. Um, so it's been really neat to start watching. Uh, late last year, we did a survey of customers. And we've seen a, depending on the survey, and we did a couple different ones, between 10 and 15% pickup on um, uh, customer satisfaction nice. uh, percentage wow. points. So we're thrilled by that um, because, in, you know, think about your personal life. If something happens, you get rear-ended, something happens at the house, the first thing you think of is, Ugh, now I have to go through that whole insurance process. Mm -hmm. So if we can take some of that hassle out, it just makes a huge difference to our customers. And we're starting to see that it really does, and they're, they're talking so highly about it, um, and seeing the retention rates from those, those folks after they have claims has really made a difference. Um, not only, like I said earlier, not just for our customers, but for our employees too, because they're seeing that they can get done with a claim, move on to their next claim, and not have to worry about, did that other person get paid? Did they not? Do I have any follow-up? Because they know that that payment went through immediately 
Um, and it gets folks to where they need to be and gets them really back on the right track to, to get their lives back in order. Oh, it's, it's tremendous. It lifts a con tremendous pain point, especially after some, a difficult event, whether it right. be a disaster or a, you know, an accident. So, and uh, we're seeing so many value. of those now with yeah. um, you know, the, the hurricane season last year and then the, the wildfires that came through. It's just really made a, a huge difference for folks. And, yeah. um, and, and it really does, you know, not to be cheesy, but it really does help them feel that they're back in good hands with Allstate to be able to get that money right away. And, and, and really, what's better as a parent to be able to say, okay, we've got the money, we can go check into a hotel because you've got everybody packed in the car, you know, 100 miles from home. So it's, it's made a big difference. Yeah, so since you said it, I'll say that's priceless. <laughs> okay, because you have. Shameless plug. Okay, so Matt, you're, the work that you're company is doing with transit authorities around the globe is really catalyzing a shift in payments. Mm -hmm. um, so we've seen, we've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, today even contactless and the uh, adoption of contactless in the U.S. has really um, taken quite, quite some time, uh, much longer than some other countries like the U.K. and Poland and Australia, um, where transit played a very big role in actually driving more contactless usage. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about how, um, what you've seen in other markets and other countries may translate here in the US as well? Yeah, so um, three locations come to mind, um, being Vancouver, um, obviously in Canada, Sydney, Australia, and, and London in the UK. Um, and certainly the trend across the transit industry is to, is to make this migration to contactless. Um, there's been some, uh, apprehension in the U.S. market, mostly because the cards haven't been issued. The, the venture card system that we deployed in Chicago actually does accept contactless payment cards. You can use use contactless card in Chicago. You can use a mobile wallet in Chicago, but the volume of transactions is really, really low there. Um, in Vancouver, where there, there is a decent population of, of cards, um, there the customer has created a fair differential um, between the fare you pay for, for a contactless tra transaction relative to the fare that you would pay if you used your transit closed loop card, which is called Compass. Um, and really the, th the thought process behind that was that it's, it's kind of a separate, convenient um, tourist product, the contactless experience. And there we've only seen a 1.3% penetration of contactless cards relative to um, the, co the Compass card, the transit card. So, Although there's people there that um, are using their contactless cards um, for that convenience reason, it's, it's a really small proportion there as well. In Sydney, where we've deployed contactless across most of the modes, it's live on uh, ferry, light rail, and um, heavy rail, but not on bus. We're seeing about 800,000 transactions a month, which is a decent volume of, of transactions, um, but still in the minority, mostly because people that would transfer from ferry or train to bus, which lots of people in Sydney do. I lived there for three years. The, the connection points between the, the ferry, train, and bus network are pretty, um, pretty common. And so that's one of the reasons we haven't seen the penetration there um, get into the majority. Um, on the other hand, London, uh, which started deploying in 2000, late 2012, was fully deployed by um, 2014. Now we're seeing six million of 15 million transactions every day are contactless. Um, and all, amongst the payment options in London, basically you have the Oyster card, which is the, the transit card in London. Um, you have a season ticket version of that, which is where people are buying a, a weekly or a monthly ticket. Um, and then you have the contactless. And Oyster, Oyster and contactless um, operate in this pay-as-you-go mm -hmm. um, basis. And for pay-as-you-go journeys, contactless has now overtaken Oyster. So Oyster pay-as-you-go is on the decline. Um, season tickets are on the decline. Contactless uh, payments are increasing. And so contactless has been tremendously successful in London. And, and, and one of the major components of that, going back to what I was saying about Vancouver, is you know, one of the promises that TFL made was you will always get the best fare. Um, and they introduced capping functionality into the contactless system whereby if you use your contactless card enough times, that it would have actually been more beneficial for you to buy a season ticket, then effectively your fare ultimately gets caps at that season ticket value. So people kind of have that best fare promise, if you like, from TFL. And I think that's one of the major um, reasons we've seen the increase in um, 
in the penetration in London. Now, in terms of, in terms of the US industry, everyone is focused on New York right now. Uh, we just went into, at the beginning of um, April, we went into um, pilot with Cubic and New York MTA employees with the contactless system um, that will ultimately replace the Metro card. And uh, later this month, we'll go to public launch. We've, we just expanded the pilot today. And by the end of this month, basically, the public will be able to use it as 16 subway stations on three lines, as well as on all buses on Staten Island. And um, you know, I've, I've already seen the buzz around the New York deployment starting to grow. And I, I really think that the, the New York acceptance of transit will really drive contactless in this country, just like it did in the UK following TfL's deployment. Um, I'm not sure whether that will happen immediately, just because it is such a subset of the, the system that's going to public launch in May. Um, you'll see us pause at that kind of volume for, for a few months. And then towards the end of this year, we'll start rolling out more units across more buses and more subway stations until ultimately around the fall of 2020, the entire system is deployed, by which time I, I think the penetration of contactless in New York will be really, really significant, particularly when you think about you know, that relative customer experience of being able to use a contactless card or a mobile wallet relative to the MetroCard swipe. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and you know, we have contracts across a number of other cities across the U.S. And I think the, I think the um, almost certain success of contactless in New York, I think, will drive that same excitement across the other cities across the It's nine million commuters a day, so that type of momentum uh, <coughs> certainly will have an impact on not only the city but other cities who see that success yeah. uh, and the efficiencies that it drives. Do you see uh, in London? Do you see more? Uh, uh, taps with card or more engagement on uh, from a digital perspective? Um, that's interesting. So mobile has been increasing slightly, but the relative ratio of um, cards versus mobile wallets is 85% cards and 15% um, mobile wallets. In, in Sydney, it's a very similar rela uh, ratio. The last quarter of um, 2018, it was exactly the same ratio, 85-15%. The first month of 2019, it was 82% card, 18% mobile wallet, but uh, contactless cards are still um, the majority of the, the transactions. Yeah, great, thank so, you. I gotta say, listening to my peers over here with all these great, noble things that you guys are doing with this technology, helping people get paid and transportation, it's only fitting, because we're in Vegas, to tell you about a use case <laughs> that we have with our gambling customers where we've deployed some technology to be able to push payments in the way that you do to help them get their gambling winnings much quicker. And we've nice. seen a 15 to 20% lift in that, so <laughs> I have to throw that out there. Any There's way to improve satisfaction with gambling. You can leverage technology in. in many different ways. So. <laughs> Lynn, so you've made it super easy for consumers to receive the disbursements. What's next? What are you thinking about in terms of the next click on frictionless in the insurance category? So the last few years, we have purchased some other uh, companies. Uh, some are insurance, some are non-insurance. So our goal is to really roll that technology that we've done on the insurance side of the house to those other um, organizations. So for example, we purchased Square Trade a couple years ago, which is when you go to a store and you buy a, an electronic and they ask you if you want a, a warranty on that, it's, it's really an all-state company that owns that. Um, and it would make sense in, from my viewpoint that if you're buying technology and you're doing all of these things around that technology, why wouldn't we pay you electronically? So we're working on rolling that out and really getting that throughout our entire infrastructure. And at the same time, you know, we are looking at um, what the insurance industry is going to look like in the next 10 or 20 years with driverless cars and, and some of the other things happening. Um, in the industry, so we're trying to look at as we think that some of that is going to change, where can we intercede some of our electronic payments? So we're looking at uh, some of the various things that, that we think are happening in, within the industry to try to stay ahead a little bit. And the worst part is to, to come up with a new product or a new division and, and then have to relate back to old payment processes. So we're trying to work with our strategy group to make sure that as they come out with something, that we're ready to go from an electronic perspective. That's exciting, for sure. A similar question when you think about uh, the next click on retail and servicing merchants. What 
I, do you think is on the horizon with respect to removing friction from the payment process? Maybe something that you're not working on today, but uh, something that we've heard at the, this conference, like pay and go or uh, you know, connected devices. Um, where do you think the next uh, friction-free model is going to go? Yeah, I mean, I think they're, they're all over the place in all different types of verticals, right? I, I think just the, you, you think about just the frustrating experience of entering your credit card information and going through that whole exercise, no matter what you do, right? Again, whether you're, you're shopping, you're, you're buying food or whatever it is. So, you know, we envision that through, you know, a digital wallet capability like SRC and some of those types of things that you'll just start to see a, a, a seamless experience as it relates to payments, right? It will become kind of an afterthought, not something that is so frustrating to, to interact with and deal with, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, look, we have um, just a couple minutes left. I guess if you, if each of you could give your thoughts on, parting thoughts to the audience on, uh, from a physical to digital migration perspective, what's, what's one thing that your, each of your organizations is gonna remain focused on to Im improve the consumer experience and to ensure safe and secure uh, payment and checkout into the future. Um, Matt, why don't we start with you? Um, so, you know, I would say be excited about what's about to happen in New York. You know, one of the, one of the really interesting things about the way that the MTA are deploying this technology, which is un uh, unlike a lot of the other deployments, is normally in the deployments that a transit product like the Clipper Card or Oyster Card is deployed alongside um, contactless payments. Whereas, uh, because the starting point for the New York MTA is the Metro Card, um, and they have a need to keep the Metro Card uh, running in parallel for several years, they are only going to launch um, contactless as the digital experience across the New York subway and buses, uh, which I think is the, one of the reasons why I'm so confident that it will drive contactless penetration there, because the, 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 the transit card won't come for a couple of years later. And so I think we'll see the migration of riders um, occur pretty quickly once we deploy the devices across the system, like I said earlier. And so I think that's just like the UK, I think that will be the beginning of the trend across contactless um, in, in the retail environment. But I also think it will be the beginning of the trend of acceptance of contactless at transit across the country as well. So very focused on that right now. Yep, I agree. Lynn. And I think we're very focused on really what the future <coughs> brings to us um, from the insurance industry. Um, and to see how we can change really an 85-year-old company um, to really be more, um, really more of a technology type company as opposed to an old behemoth insurance company. And what we can do to do that, and at the same time, keeping in mind um, that we need to make sure that everything's secure um, with that as kind of our, our front. And you know, I, I think over the years I've changed, I've become more cynical. I look at things differently now that I'm on the payment side of the house. I don't trust anybody any, anymore. Um, and so I think we really need to keep that in front of, the, front of our minds of how that, how that happens from a, a fraud and, and other things perspective. But I think being, being really able to change as the industry changes will be uh, really interesting for us. Agree. Yeah, to, to, totally agree with you. That's that's exactly the same thing that we face, right? As as we think about the future, we anticipate that software will continue to disrupt various different industries, right? We'll just continue to see the pro proliferation of that, and so for us to be ready uh, with our internal uh, sources as well, a lot of people don't think about WorldPay. They think about when they think about WorldPay, they think about oh, authorization settlement. We're actually a financial technology company, right? If you think about our top five priorities, I listed off a couple of them today as we think about fraud and data, and we think about uh, Access WorldPay, which is uh, effectively an API. Um, making sure that we're able to service those new markets is something that we're, we're really focused on. But also shifting the way that we built technology from old waterfall processes to agile to be able to adapt to the new world and make sure that we continue to make that pivot to serve the new digital industries that are emerging is something that we're wildly focused on. And the customer experience and merchant experience is, is also something that is you know, very critical uh, as we think about the future. Relentless focus on the customer, absolutely. Yep. So Asif, Lynn, and Matt, thank you so much for your insights today. You are each uh, pioneers in the industries that you represent. Uh, and I just can't thank you enough, not only for the partnership that you've had with MasterCard, but also uh, what you're doing to transform payments as a whole. Uh, so thank you so much.